Hi, everyone. We're going to wait until folks get a chance to get connected, and then we will get started. Thank you for joining us. Again, welcome. We're waiting for folks to get connected. Seeing a lot of familiar faces and some new faces. So welcome everybody. I should say names, only a few of you are showing your faces, so. And we are in meeting mode. So uh, you will be able to raise your hand or uh, post in the chat. Uh, we will ask that you keep yourselves muted unless you are uh, recognized to speak because we hope to have a really large group and that can be a little bit challenging if folks are uh, trying to speak uh, while one of our presenters is speaking or while someone else is speaking. All right, I think we have slowed down a little bit. We may have additional folks uh, join us as we get started, but uh, in the interest of time, we want to go ahead and kick things off. Um, again, welcome. Uh, my name is Terry Bearden. I'm the Project Director for Organizational Capacity Building here at the National Community Action Partnership. And we are uh, thrilled to have with us our friends from ANSERT, uh, Dr. Barbara Mooney and Carrie Gibson, who are going to lead today's webinar on the topic of rapid cycle learning. Uh, we had quite a bit of robust registration, so this is obviously a timely uh, topic for us. And just as an FYI, we will be posting a recording of this session and the PowerPoint slides uh, to the resources page at the Community Action Partnership website. Uh, so look for that in the next day or two. Uh, next slide, Barbara. As always, we would like to ground ourselves in the community action promise. Uh, community action changes people's lives, embodies the spirit of hope, improves communities, and makes America a better place to live. We care about the entire community, and we are dedicated to helping people help themselves and each other. Uh, we encourage you to use the uh, promise regularly, often, wherever you can, and really uh, live into that promise. Uh, it can really help you uh, to keep, stay motivated, uh, maybe tamp down the burnout that can happen when you're uh, drinking from a fire hose as you uh, um, assist people in your communities and get engaged with community initiatives. So I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to be in the background. So feel free again to uh, pop anything that you would like brought to Barbara and Carrie's attention in the chat or raise your hand so that you can be recognized to speak. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Barbara Mooney and Carrie Gibson from Answer. Thanks again. Thank you, Terry. Thanks a lot. Thanks for inviting us uh, and promoting this, this uh, training on rapid cycle learning. As you know, um, the, so um, we have a butte. Okay, um, as you know, the uh, the results oriented management and accountability cycle has principles and practices for performance management uh, that are useful in terms of uh, closed captioning coming. Uh, they're useful in terms of, of learning new things. And one way to learn new things is this concept called rapid cycle learning. So we thought we would talk a little bit about what is performance management, how the rapid cycle learning pro process can be used, uh, how can it improve the skills of the folks who are actually engaged in rapid cycle learning projects, and then give you some examples uh, for creating a, a project of your own we're probably not gonna get much time to talk about the helpful tools for data analysis, but we're gonna uh, present them to you so that you can then uh, use them at a later date and we might have a follow-up webinar. So um, when staff is asked what kinds of skills they need to do a better job, uh, the thing that comes to the surface a lot is data analysis. 
we would like to know better about how to analyze data. And so one of the ways to do that is to think about how performance management in general terms can really help to focus in on improvement and maintenance of policies and services. So what is performance management? Well, in many different uh, situations, you'll think of, uh, you'll find performance management being described in different ways, but from our Office of Community Services, we have um, this framework that they've identified that's called PEAK. And PEAK stands for uh, performance, uh, evaluation, accountability, accessibility, and knowledge. And you'll see that um, this includes some things that we're very familiar with in the Community Action Network, the Community Needs Assessment, the American Customer Satisfaction Index, organizational standards, accountability measures for state and federal offices, Roma, Roma Next Generation. And then if you look at the end here where we're looking at accessibility and knowledge, we're thinking about the CSBG story, making the CSBG story available and knowing what the CSBG story is. And so, um, what performance management helps us to do is to answer uh, this question of how well does the network operate? And so we want to look at local agencies that meet organizational standards. That's, that's one way to prove how well the network operates. Um, the CSBG offices and OCS meet accountability measures and uh, that the network understands and uses a performance management system. And so you'll see the Roma cycle there um, on the right of the screen uh, where we're looking at results-oriented management and accountability, thinking about agency level needs to assure that there's a reliable process in place for identifying specific issues in the lives of individuals and families. So what's the community needs assessment process? Um, and then to think about how CSBG can leverage uh, other uh, resources to help address those issues. Oops, hold on. So we found that first question, how well does the network operate in the national theory of change? I skipped over this one when I clicked my enter, uh, but I just wanted to call your attention to the two questions that are under performance. How well does the network operate, which we just talked about, and what difference does the network make? So uh, one of the things that we were thinking about how well is looking at organizational standards. Um, the standards really guide us, but we know that organizational culture is the unspoken process that's behind all the guiding principles and practices that are articulated. And we sometimes don't know how practices that are part of our organizational culture start. There's that little cartoon there on the right. But these are assumptions that might be passed on for experiences that really might not be valid any longer, but they still drive the way work gets done. So you always have to think about what's your organizational culture as you look in terms of identifying what and what you wanna know and why you're interested in the data. Um, it, it has to match your organizational culture. The second question in the performance management process is thinking about what difference does the network make? So if we have really great organizations, but we're not making, uh... oh, Terry, there's some folks in the waiting room. Can you let them in? So we, we think about in terms of looking at how, what difference the network makes that there are individuals and families that are receiving high quality services and that the network really has um, outcomes at the family level and at the community level. So the Roma cycle guides us to collect data about our actions and their results. So I said maybe we could just sneak the hell in, I don't Okay. So, uh, so some things that we thought as we started thinking about why rapid cycle learning might be important 
is um, that we hear these kinds of things all the time that sometimes agencies live with low expectations. You know, they, they do the same thing they've always done, even if their results are not um, greater than what they'd like to be, or they're not exploring any creative responses. They're just living with what they've been doing. And sometimes their approach is to focus on each little problem as it comes up. It's like a whack-a-mole, you know, we solve one problem and you have this general feeling that something is always going wrong. And there's just this idea of these are the constraints that are in place. Um, this is the way things have always been done. So, so if those things are happening in your organizations, we need to think of a new way to really um, consider uh, looking at the, the project. So, um, so we're gonna talk about rapid cycle learning, what it is and how it can be used. This is still me, right? <laughs> so there are some traditional kinds of evaluation projects that we're gonna, we're gonna talk about. And typically those processes have assessment and planning happening over a three to five year uh, period. Uh, these are, we're looking at uh, calendar year programs. Uh, we're looking at reporting. It's typically done annually, but maybe done more, more, more like quarterly or monthly. And then we have an evaluation that's always looking backwards. Uh, it, it gives us this big picture of the project. Um, how, how was the project implemented and what happened? So it's really say, here's what we thought would happen and here's what's actually happened. But when we're looking at rapid cycle learning, uh, we're looking at something that's, that's more uh, direct. And, and we hear, oh, we're too busy to do evaluation. Uh, I love this cartoon, the little guys that they're too busy to try the wheel, to try to move things forward. Uh, so are you too busy to improve uh, how we, we need to think about changes uh, to the needs and the plans and the targets? Um, things are going to change and effective agencies have a quick way to think about that. We saw this over um, uh, with COVID that people who had this quick and easy process we're able to embrace a continuous learning process more easily than their peers. Let me know if I'm running over, Carrie. You're good. Okay, good, good. All right, I can't see the numbers on the slides, I'm sorry. Um, okay, so, so something is urgent. And again, uh, we got a lot of this information from the, uh, the CARES work that was done we think that we have to do something quickly, but, but remember not every quick solution is the right solution. We see that human services professionals always jump to find a solution, but sometimes these urgent problems are very complicated. And if you, if you jump to the first solution that you think of, that might not solve the problem or it Worse, you could be tackling a problem that doesn't that is the wrong problem. So you need to be able to have enough factors to allow you to understand what's the bigger problem. And then you can think strategically. And we think that you can do this in a quick way. We can think, think that you can do this quickly. So rapid cycle learning methods are intended to, to really expedite this idea of program improvement. Um, they support data-driven decision-making. Uh, you'll see that one of the things that you do is you gather data and you look at it and you understand it. You don't just say, oh, I think this is what's wrong, but you can actually validate um, that you use data and then you test something that's proposed for a short period of time. And then you can come back and look at uh, what happened with the data that you've collected during that test time and that you might have many cycles of learning before you actually settle on uh, the, the final solution. Um, it, this is a, a little graphic that's from business. Uh, it, it, if you think about if you're Coca-Cola and you have a new uh, 
taste profile that you want to put out there. You know, you have the new Coca-Cola. Uh, is it going to sell? Well, before you do a, a, a national release of the new product, what you want to do is release it to a small test group. They taste it. They give you information back. Um, and then there can be some tweaks in the formula before you send it out again. And that's what happens in uh, when you're building a product in industry. You define a concept, um, you, you test out the design, you validate the, the concept, and only then do you launch the product. So it's a focus on connect, uh, collecting data early in a project and often during the planning phases um, so that you're able to make decisions that help you make an, a, come to another phase. So uh, this is a series of graphics that are all about learning cycles. You probably recognize a lot of them. Um, and uh, they're all about thinking of something and then trying to check on it and then doing it and then planning it again. And so this is really uh, a little piece of the Roma cycle. So we've got the Roma framework here in the middle, and then we have the rapid cycle framework over on the side. This slide is actually a graphic that was taken from um, a, a, a training that uh, OCS did uh, reporting on some material that was developed through one of their other grantees, uh, Mathematica. And Mathematica talked about how the Roma cycle can be uh, supplemented by rapid cycle learning. That rapid cycle learning can support um, and overcome decision paralysis by rolling out small pilots before you actually do the full-blown training or full-blown uh, project. And that you're in the implementation step, you can identify barriers quickly before they become ingrained in, uh, in bad implementation. And then you respond to anything that might be happening that might be going astray and develop challenges. So uh, it's a way to uh, to pull. And what we've done here is we've taken the basic Roma cycle and then we've uh, uh, telescoped out uh, up here in the uh, in the top right corner uh, where you create uh, you identify a factor, create a question that you're going to answer, gather some data um, over a short period of time, three to four weeks. You look at the data, what questions were answered by that data collection and what new questions were raised, and then think about how you might create a new strategy or service and do that again until you feel comfortable. And then you go through into the planning stage. You plan how to implement the new strategy, try out the changes, gather data, gather data, gather data is always part of each cycle. And then you review the data and revise if necessary. And then only once you're satisfied with all that, do your changes become standard. Now it's care. Now it's care. <laughs> so that's just a big overview of, of what rapid cycle learning is about and how it fits into what you probably already know about the Roma cycle. And now um, it carries going to get a little more in depth. Thanks, Karen. Barbara, do you want to keep the slides up or do you want me to pull them up on my um, end? I can keep them up and you can say next slide. Okay, perfect. Great. Okay. Uh, so uh, as, as you saw in one of those previous graphics that Barbara showed us, uh, one of the main uh, tenets of this kind of rapid cycle process is to avoid uh, paralysis, right? So decision paralysis or this idea of analysis paralysis. I love this graphic here. We've got this person when confronted with all of these facts and figures and data points, and it can just become very overwhelming to think about, oh, where do I even begin? Um, so Barbara, if you'll take us forward to the next piece. So ways that we can can be cognizant and avoiding falling into that trap of analysis paralysis. So the first thing that we want to do 
is we need to clearly state what is it that you want to know. So think about, you know, if you're if you're back in school, uh, if you're thinking about when you had a, a dissertation or a research project, you may have this huge topic area of focus, but but you really want to start narrowing down. So kind of funneling and, and focusing on one particular question. So what do you want to know? Maybe you're curious about, hmm, are our policies and procedures, um, you know, really uh, guiding us in the direction that we need to be going in? Um, maybe there was something in one of the last reports that you compiled that really stood out to you and you think, gosh, well, why are we seeing decreases in the number of people that we're serving or decreases in how many uh, or a certain kind of service we're providing? What if we're not seeing outcomes achieved at the level that that we're, we're typically seeing. Maybe we're seeing some budgeting items that are different, differences in populations that are being served or receiving services. Maybe this is the year, you know, that suddenly you're like, what in the world is going on? Why do we see so many seniors requesting uh, help with maintaining their housing? So you're starting to get some of these little uh, curiosities peaked for you. Or maybe you hear something that another staff member says, or you're in a board meeting and someone observes something. Oh, did you know that this is going on in, in XYZ community? And you think, you know, I really want to know more about that. So first step in the data analysis process, what do you want to know? And then Barbara, if you'll move us to the next piece, once we figure out what do we want to know, now we need to think about, well, why do I want to know? Is this driven by an internal need to figure this out? Or is there some sort of external focus or push on us that's saying, hey, you need to be able to answer this question? Maybe we want to validate our mission and make sure we're on the right track. Maybe we need to look back to our local level theory of change and say, hmm, we need to answer this question because we, we need to know if we're, if we're seeing these assumptions that we've laid forth in our, in our theory of change, if we're seeing that they're actually holding true. Maybe it's something just as simple as, you know what, I think something could be working better. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's not working well, but maybe you think it could still just be improved a little bit. The only way we know if we should strengthen or abandon something is if we analyze the data that we have collected. We may want to be uh, to think about answering the question that we've identified because we've got some requirements from our funders who say, hey, this is an important question to us. Now y'all need to figure it out and tell us what's going on. Or maybe you're finding, you know what, our reports are consistently late. They're really difficult to compile. Where is some breakdown in the system that's making us have such a struggle on this end? Uh, that could be the why, the motivator behind why you wanna uh, figure some of these pieces out. So looking at the next piece, looking at the next slide here, when we think about how to avoid analysis paralysis, when we're thinking about being faced with this huge, this huge problem area. So gosh, I don't know, what are some of the challenges we see in our network every day? We wanna to try to figure out why is there systemic poverty? Oh, I don't know. Um, we wanna figure out how are we gonna overcome uh, the, the fallout that happened as a result of the pandemic. These are really big, huge issues. And when you think about how do I how do I eradicate poverty? You know, most of us are then going to say, well, let me go organize my paper clips or do something else that's a little more tangible. So to address a big problem, you want to break it down into smaller chunks. And so there's a technique that can be used to do this that's actually referred to as what's called Swiss cheesing. So it's a way to solve very complex problems. You don't wait for the one big fix that will solve all the problems. So often when we think about reporting challenges, you know, being able to compile all of the data that we collect uh, throughout our days, we think about, um, oh, Barbara, if you could bring us back to- Oh, the sorry, slide. sorry. Okay. I don't know where I am. <laughs> I okay. think many of us don't know where we are some days. Uh, but, uh, so let me, I'll go ahead and jump in here and get it, uh, get it going on my end. I got it. You got it's it? Back. Okay, perfect, perfect. Yep. Yeah. So think about, you know, we say, oh, if we only had, you know, one new magical database, that would just solve all of our problems. Well, many of us have been uh, holding our breath uh, uh, for this for quite some time, right? And we know this is not an easy fix. 
but we don't have to wait for the big perfect solution to present itself. We can start to think about, about moving from this all or nothing thinking. So we want to start thinking about multiple smaller solutions versus just saying, ah, oh, washing my hands because until the perfect solution comes to us, we're just not going to do anything about it. So when you think about the Swiss cheesing approach, what you're really doing is you're making a list of all of the factors that you want to learn about within that problem question that you've identified. And then you're prioritizing that list. So the biggest and most important important factors at the top. And then essentially what you're doing is you're really then just starting to drill holes. So eventually you're you're moving from this big block of cheese to this this uh, Swiss cheese. So you're starting to, to break things down into more manageable steps. Um, so Barbara's going to share some examples uh, of what this can look like. So this was an example uh, that was provided in the Mathematica challenge um, that OCS funded. And this is just one example. So um, the agency has a parenting skills development program and they realized that there were a number of people, um, another of mothers uh, that are coming to their program who have uh, Spanish as their primary language, but they're not getting the fathers to attend. So their question was, how could we recruit more men uh, with Spanish as their primary language? And so uh, they thought of it in terms of this, this graphic. So the if, improvement cycle one was trying out a new enrollment form uh, for three to four weeks a new way to maybe they thought maybe the way they were trying to enroll the fathers was the barrier. So think about that enroll enrollment for try it out for a short time and then look at the data. Stop at that point. Don't just do it forever, but do it for a short period of time. Um, then look at your data. Were there more, uh, more uh, fathers with uh, primary uh, Spanish uh, language skills? Um, and then it, it, figure out if that was working, what could they tweak even more, and then try it out again with a revised process and see now you've got more people involved. Um, and and it, the, there was a short interview at the end of the first cycle, and now also an interview and a survey with the staff, uh, and then to analyze the team, and then to do it again. This is sort of this little cycle out here at the end is a way of saying, and then repeat. <laughs> so. Um, so just to break down what was happening at this agency in the first learning cycle, uh, they identified the goal of the cycle. They're going to do partnership development training, uh, look at some skills development from the from the training. And then there's also a data collection uh, piece in each of the learning cycle goals. Whoops. Sorry. Um, and then in the second cycle, they're going to assess the strategies, the, the success of the strategies, gather, gather qualitative and quantitative data. And then goal, the goal of the third cycle is looking at more direct outreach, passive recruitment, word of mouth training, and uh, monitor the overall success. So uh, to set out the goal of each cycle, uh, and then to talk about the data collection methods. Um, so. Um, Gary, you, you want to talk about setting up the project? Sure, absolutely. Yep. So again, remember, we're going back to that question. What is it that we want to know? What are we trying to figure out? We're, we're Swiss cheesing here. So the first thing that you're going to want to do is you're going to want to set the stage or, or create the, the, the right conditions. So think about this like a science experiment. We're making sure that our environment is good and ready for this kind of uh, exploration. So you want to engage others who are interested in the topic. You, you could certainly engage in a rapid cycle uh, learning project by yourself, but the more people you have to bring in, uh, the more opportunities for varying viewpoints, for being creative and, and being able to really come about solving a problem in a different way. 
you want to make sure that you have the support of your organization. You would not want to identify an area to explore that you do not have the support of your leadership team around, that the board is not supportive of. You, you just don't want to do that. You don't want to engage in time and resources and effort in something that you're not going to be able to move forward with these uh, uh, iterative tests that we're going to talk about. And you want to have a sense of urgency around this topic to be explored. And this is, again, what really sets you know, tr those traditional evaluation projects where we think, oh, well, we'll just gather data over the course of the year. And then at the end of the year, then we'll look at it and we'll figure it out. But when we're talking about rapid ROMA or rapid cycle projects, you want to have some urgency around this topic because we want to do it in a rapid way. So Barbara, if you'll move us to the next piece here, think about who you want on your team. Think about the different stakeholders, the different perspectives. Think about who might have data points that you don't have that you need to make sure are brought forth and front and center at the table. You don't want to do this alone. I'll say that again. You do not want to do this alone. So how do you decide what to do? So here's some things to think about. The first thing you wanna do is pick something that's not going to damage your current programming. So for example, if you think, you know what, we're not seeing a lot of foot traffic at our center that we have in the Northwestern part of our county, uh, let's just start our, our uh, process. We'll just close the center and then we'll see what happens. No, we, we don't think that's really the best way to go. Instead, think about, a test that would help you figure out what might happen if the site closed. So you could use some interviews with residents, with other stakeholders, with other community members to find out what the impact of that closure would be. Explore other options that might stand in in the place of services uh, if that center were to be closed. So before you, you move forward, make sure that it's not gonna be so dramatic and, and shut everything down. And again, picking something that's in your control or that you have influence over changing. You wouldn't wanna create, say, a whole new um, application process only to have it run up the chain and leadership team or other folks say, we're not doing this. Uh, so thanks for all the time you spent, but we're moving on to something else. So what kind of topic areas would be appropriate for this kind of rapid cycle uh, approach? Implementation challenges. Barbara just gave the example of looking at recruiting a different population for a program. So maybe you're you're seeing you're not recruiting well, or maybe you, recruiting's not the problem, but participation is dropping off and folks aren't completing or graduating at the rate that they used to. Maybe you're seeing some struggles around data collection, data storage, data retrieval. That might be an opportunity to kind of do some factoring and Swiss cheesing. Are there some barriers that you've noticed, uh, perhaps related to intake or service delivery? One of the big things is we just don't have time, right? We don't have time to follow up on those services and see what happened. Well, what if you created the time? What if you carved out a little project there? Or maybe there's opportunities around looking at your measurement tools and processes that you could do some rapid cycle testing around. So keep it small. Remember, we're not hurtling ourselves at this big problem full force. We're, we're biting off little bitty pieces. We're picking out little bitty individual factors so that we can then start to see um, some movement there. So there was a question in the chat about um, which of those, when there was a slide with all those different kinds of uh, uh, processes, um, act, do, plan, um, and, yeah. and so on, uh, which is best or, or, or what might be most effective for a small team. And I think that it's not, those are all the same, basically. <laughs> they're, they're asking you to do the same things. They're asking you to plan something, try it out, analyze your data, and then try it out again, plan something else. So it's the Roma cycle in many, it's the, it's all of the performance management cycles are actually about the same things. It's just the language that's used. But more important is the topic area, more important than that, uh, those graphics. It's what do you want to talk about? And then um, how do you decide what to do? what you want to talk about, and then some questions, some possible questions uh, of how you might, um, that you might answer with your data. So 
um, if that didn't answer your question um, uh, it, that was in the chat, put 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 another question in. So go ahead, Carrie, back to you. Great. No, that's a good question. Um, so analysis really is just this idea of questions and questions and peeling back the layers of the onion, you know, to really get to, to the heart of the issue. And these are basic questions that we that we talk about all of the time, but you still need to have them. Uh, you need to be able to ask them and, and have them answered. So thinking about, did we do what we thought we would do? Did we serve the people that we thought we would serve? And remember, this is going back to our, need, our needs assessment should have informed our plans, and, and now we're pulling out data to evaluate and match back. We ultimately want to know, did we make an impact on the identified needs? And can we tell, this is the big one, can we tell what service or what set of services produced the best opportunity for results? And we know that that one-to-one -one ratio is much easier to evaluate, one service, one outcome. But it's when the multiple services are provided that we have a little bit more of a challenge being able to pull out and tease out well, which combination actually was the most impactful? We might also want to ask questions about our population. Are we seeing that populations are achieving outcomes at different rates than others? There's a wealth of information available to us if we, if we start to answer that question. Are we looking at disparities? Are we looking at, at gaps here? Is this a systemic issue? Is this something that's on the community level that we're seeing play out with our families and the individuals we serve? More programmatic end, we wanna think about, are we recruiting and enrolling enough folks for us to be able to achieve our outcomes? Because we know life happens, it's not realistic for us to think that if we start with 100 folks in a program, we're gonna end with 100 folks at the end of that intervention. So we know that we may have to enroll more in order to be able to make sure we've got enough folks to be able to actually obtain those outcomes. And then the big one, because we can't do it by ourselves, right? Do we have resources available to us to be able to meet these needs? Do we need to bring in new resources? Are we, are we in a situation where we're getting ready to lose a resource that we've been largely dependent on? So those are questions to ask as well. And then just being curious, was there something unexpected that influenced the outcomes? Did a new employer come in or did an employer exit? What happened on the community level that influenced that? Or maybe what happened on the agency level? Did we lose key staff? Did we lose key funding? Um, but all of these questions are, are, we are able to answer them with the data that we have collected. Barbara, do you want to say anything else there? Uh, no, it's just a lead into this question mm -hmm. of um, how good is it? You know, we ask this question all the time, is, is what you're doing good? Uh, and so we just have to clarify what it is that we're trying to answer. Um, sometimes we hear things that people are doing and it's so amorphous it's like it it doesn't really it doesn't really show impact to me because I don't have a context so it's, people might say we assisted 100 people to secure employment okay <laughs> on the face of it that's 100 people who got a job but is that is that good uh, what kind of employment was it was it full-time part-time was it within benefits uh, what did we do? How did we assist? Uh, sometimes people talk only about the service they provide. And then sometimes this they talk in such general terms that you don't know what it is that they, they did. Oh, we referred them. Okay. So they, they couldn't just look it up in the phone book or I, mean, I guess there's no phone book. I'm showing my age, but they couldn't just Google it. You know, you had to come to you to be a referral. No, I mean, we know for sure that when we give someone a, a referral, we want to do a warm handoff. But how does that make a difference? And that would be part of um, the questions that you would ask. Um, do other agencies have similar outcomes uh, with similar populations? And uh, what are the services that other people give? So just more of a definition of what you were talking about. I think you're going to pick us up here, Barbara. Not for long. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
we're going to talk about identifying data elements that we collect. So when we talk to people about collecting data, sometimes they go immediately to, oh, I'm going to pull that report from my database. But is that really the only thing that you need to know? So what we do when we help people set up rapid cycle learning projects is we help people create a plan to help them to think about uh, who's going to be involved in collecting and analyzing the data. Again, what resources do you need? You always need staff time, but you might need some other things. You might need access to the database or you might need um, access to customers to interview them. Um, you, might, you might need to have a Zoom account to um, uh, set up face-to-face -face virtual interviews with people. Uh, so the resources piece shouldn't just be assumed that you have them, you need to spell it out. And then to think about what are the action steps for data collection? Who's gonna, who's gonna collect which pieces of the data and by when? So that's what we mean when we talk about creating a plan. So this is an essential piece um, more important than which of those programs that you use, you, you use um, Roma or something else, but it's about what is your plan. And, and then really think about what data is going to help you to validate what you know. So I, I talked to someone and um, they say, um, oh, um, our our biggest need in our community is uh, there's not any uh, affordable housing. Well, what 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 does that mean? What do you know about the situation? Well, everybody knows that there's not enough affordable housing anywhere in the country. Well, that's true, but let's define it for your particular community. If you are going to take action in your community, you need to know a whole lot more about it. You need to know what neighborhoods are involved. You know, you need to know um, if there are uh, if there are certain uh, ranges of the cost of housing that could be influenced. You you need to have a lot more information, and that comes from analyzing the data. So don't assume that you and everyone knows what's all involved with the situation, and then say, well, here's what could prove that. Here's a list of available data. Um, this, this could prove that, this could prove that. And then say, oh, I'd like to know this, but I don't have any data about that. So then your list should include the data that you don't have. So that would be a way to, uh, to help you think about your plan. Do you wanna talk about this one? Yeah, sure. So, oops, oops, um, oops, oops. yep. So use the data that you do have, right? So we are swimming in data. We have so much data, most of us available to us. We have data in our annual report. We have other kind of quantitative data sets available to us in our own internal agency reports. We have census data. We have very, very granular local level data uh, that can tell us the number, the scope, the impact of things. We also have qualitative avail data available to us. So we have the opportunity to engage with our primary customers, those that are receiving those direct services. We can get qualitative data from our supporting customers, our stakeholders, our community members, our partners. And we also have data that comes to us through our measurement tools and processes as well. So use the data that you do have. And then you have to prepare that data. So uh, moving us to the next slide, you're going to want to aggregate that data, you know, put it in the buckets. How do you want to how do you want to organize it and then start to think about what are some factors that might be contributing to these data points that we see. So why do we have to do this analysis? We get the data. We need to clean and prepare the data. We need to remove outliers and errors. We need to question, well, what's missing? This doesn't necessarily seem complete here. We also want to think about data in terms of the context, so the larger environment. We can compare, we can make visualizations with our data, because what we know, think about garbage in is garbage out. If we don't have the right data, how are we going to make the right decisions? And so cleaning and analyzing the data sets us up to be able to do that. We know that errors can occur throughout the life cycle of the data. And so this is why we wanna make sure we're constantly looking at it. Those errors can occur when we collect it, 
it could be incomplete. It could be entered in incorrectly. Uh, how painful when you enter in another zero to something and now your math is just totally skewed. Uh, data errors can happen when we move something into storage. It can get lost, it can get mislabeled. Errors can happen when we retrieve that data, when we aggregate those data elements. All of that then impacts the quality of information that we've been able to glean from the analysis of that data. And we can also have errors occur. We can make judgment based on wrong information. So then that starts us down a path where we're going to be perhaps providing the wrong intervention that could ultimately do more harm than good. And that's the one thing that rapid cycle learning can help you with is that making judgments and based on information that's not complete or correct. That if you um, if you do something in a rapid cycle process, you catch that error quickly, and then you can go back and check your data. So in the chat, um, Terry just reminded that we'll be wrapping up in a few minutes. So I'm going to like go through. Let, let's look through some of these and see. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see something that we want to make sure. How about this one? We really want to talk about this one. That um, That's important. After you look at your data, you decide some action that you're going to take. Well, we could change our application process, or we could um, open our center at a different time, or we could have services somewhere else. You know, whatever it is that your action is, make sure that you take that action and try it out. Um, but if you don't try it out, if you, you think about here's the action that we need to take and six months later, you still haven't done it, that's you're not going to overcome the, the uh, problem uh, in that way. So you want to make sure that you're overcoming the barriers. And this is just a little spiral that talks about lack of uh, uh, fear of failure can sometimes uh, get you to not not solve your problem. So let's see. Um, there's a list of tools here, uh, charts and tables that that'll be part of the recording that you'll get. But before we get to this last section, um, I'm going to open for questions. Uh, you can unmute or put something in the chat if you have any questions specifically to think about. I don't see anything. All right. If you try one option and you see some improvement, um, do you suggest stopping it? So that will be based on your data. If you see some uh, improvement, you would want to you would want to analyze where that improvement was happening. Uh, was there a specific um, uh, element of your project that was working really well? And then you might want to you might want to support that. Um, and if you see that they're that it's only working in one area and not in another, you might you might try another option in another area. But you wouldn't make the decision as to whether you would stop it or not until you looked at the data surrounding your trial. So so I mean I think that's that's important. Um, so what's the top part of that chat? Uh, possible actions based on a good method for deciding on which action to try first. Really, that's the part of data analysis skill building that you will gain in this process. If you have a set of data that you're looking at to say, okay, there are a couple of different actions that I can take here. Um, let's, let's try this one and say, this is why I think I should try this one. Make record of that try it out for a certain period of time and then come back and you and your team. That's why when Carrie says, don't try to do this alone, it's so important that you have a team because you could get you could get in love with your one solution and whether it's working or not, or say, oh, we just need more time, but your team will help you to try it out. So this process is about you getting into your data and coming up with some good ideas uh, as to what to try and then making decisions based on what you've done. And what we'd like to do is to have a, a some input from the network across the country to say, here's a rapid cycle learning project that we've tried, um, and here's what we learned from it, so that we could start posting those and people could see, oh, this is what somebody tried and this is what they found out. And once we had a body of that, Sarah, then we would have a uh, more of an opportunity to be able to, to guide people through the process. But we don't really have much data because we haven't done this kind of work 
in the past. And I'm thinking too about the the grid, you know, where you think about the the convergent, is it urgent? Is it important? Is it easy? You know, kind of kind of doing that sort of internal problem solving with your team. So thinking, do you want to go for something that's quick and easy to test? Or do you want to say, well, this feels a little more urgent and more important, and then just coming to that internal consensus about which feels the most right next step to do or to take? So this is a chart. This is one of the most useful charts that you can use in data analysis. Um, and you can get it through, um, you can make one of these charts using Excel. Uh, and, and there's a, a tool that walks you right through it. I didn't know how to use it, and I'm really not very savvy. Um, and I could do it, but here's a situation where I wanted to know um, what was the what was the what was the reason for uh, uh, falls in in a in a uh, community, and so um, they had these were the there were different reasons, and what you usually find is if you have a hundred uh, examples that. 90% of them will be caused by one or two factors. And this is called the vital few. So you wanna see like if, if you have, um, if you have a lot of errors on your annual report da data, where were the errors? Were they, um, were they in the reporting of uh, services? Were they in the reporting of certain individuals of a certain age? And, and you wanna find where the most, uh, significant numbers of examples of the issue are being uh, are being raised uh, so that you can uh, you can folks oh where to send that info Terry says well Terry let's talk about whoops let's talk about how to I have to go back to sharing so you can do the last couple of slides uh, let's talk about setting something up on the partnerships website so that we can um, we can find a place to um, those are a couple more things, the journey map. Um, and, and as we just end our discussion, think about creating your data collection plan, think about your first cycle of data collection and analysis, try it out, and then let us know, um, let us know what's happening. And, and uh, we can put something on the Roma website or we can post something, a place on the, um, uh, the partnership website to get some ideas about, uh, or you can just email us um, about your projects that you're doing. And if you have questions, I've, I've started this project and I don't know where to go next, just email us and uh, we'll be glad to talk with you uh, to help you brainstorm through some ideas because we really want to get um, a body of knowledge to share with our network. And Barbara, before we uh, wrap, would you mind to take it back to the slide uh, that's called the Rapid Roma Timetable, just to put that information right well, back out? Maybe. Okay. I, I don't. Maybe not. Sorry, folks. This is fascinating, isn't it? Do you know where it is? It's slide 70. Okay. All right. Well, that doesn't look like slide 70. No, there it is. That, okay. <laughs> yep. So just wanted to, to uh, make sure we underscore how essentially rapid cycle learning is using the Roma cycle in a rapid kind of fashion. So just to have, you know, we start with assessment. What do you know needs to change? Making that plan, doing those small tests, that's the implementation piece, collecting the data, reporting to make sure, you know, are we on the right track? Are we, are we doing what we thought we would do? Are we reaching the right people? Did this change make a difference? If we didn't, okay, let's start again. What else can we do? So, so you're taking those skills that you know around assessment planning implementing, collecting and analyzing the data, and then you're just doing it in a more rapid kind of, of way, that's where the rapid cycle learning comes from. And then you're creating your Swiss cheese because each one of those little tests is what's then gonna help you to conquer that larger problem. Okay, thank you. Uh, last call for, we still have a couple minutes left. Uh, last call for questions, comments. 
as part of the posting of this process, we will uh, uh, we'll have a place where you can share your information with us. We'll 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 put that together before our talk. Okay, Miss Terry. All right, thank you guys. I I learn a lot every time, and you know we've always talked in the Roma world about okay, so after we get started with Roma, what then? And and this is a perfect what then. Uh, kind of presentation to, to help us really um, go that next step and, and think about, you know, what does this mean and how do we, what do we mean by evaluation? What do we mean by analyze our data, analyze our data, and then what? So I greatly appreciate you guys uh, coming on and sharing this info. Um, I want to do, as I call it, a couple of NCAP commercials. Uh, so we've had great response to um, our upcoming annual convention in Seattle. Registration is still open though. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So if you want to snag a, a picture of that QR code, it'll take you to the uh, registration page. Um, our hotel is booked, but we have provided a, um, a list of other hotels in the area. Uh, one thing I was asked to bring to everyone's attention is if you have any board members who will be attending the annual convention, we're going to be having a board development institute on Tuesday, August 27th as a pre-conference um, from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, so uh, there's a, a regist separate registration fee available for that. Um, so we um, ask you to register your, your board members that are going to be present um, for that session. I'm going to pop a link in the chat as well and some info on that session. Um, next slide, Barbara. We have uh, just opened registration for new executive director institutes. We're gonna have two this year, one on the East Coast, October 29th and 30th, and one on the West Coast, uh, December 3rd and 4th. So we'll be in Alexandria, Virginia in October, uh, San Diego, California in December. Uh, so um, the content's gonna be the same, uh, but if you're interested in attending uh, one of those, we wanted to make it as accessible as possible. Uh, we define new executive directors as those who've been in their positions for five years uh, or less, um, but we're not going to check your um, employment <laughs> record if you're slightly <laughs> over that. Um, so feel free to uh, check out the website again, grab a grab a screenshot uh, of the uh, QR codes and, and check those out. We There's additional information at the NCAP website. And as always, last slide, please complete a brief evaluation. Uh, we are also uh, into evaluating our performances and making sure that NCAP is providing uh, information that our members need. And I know Barbara and Carrie like to get feedback um, on their presentation. So we have a link here as well as a QR code. I'm a big QR code fan. Um, and in answer to Jack's question, uh, Zelina has helped me by copying and pasting the link where the slides and recording of this session will be posted. It takes us a day or two to get those up. Um, but just as an FYI, um, all NCAP webinars are that are recorded are posted there. So if you thought, man, I wish I hadn't had, you know, 10 million things to do and <laughs> uh, other uh, webinar happened, chances are you can find the recording and the slides uh, at that same website that Zelina so kindly shared. Um, so with that- That's where I clicked when I got off base. I, I saw that. I went, oh, I wonder what that is. <laughs> on it. Jerry's like, where are you going? <laughs> no, I knew where you were going and I assumed why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so thanks for that, all those questions. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And we are um, right at time. Uh, we have another minute. If anybody has had anything uh, come up and, and they would like to ask a question, please do so. Um, if not, we will thank you for your time and attention. And, uh, and you can always get in touch with us individually. So, you, you know, we're easy to reach. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Uh, thank you, guys. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much.